get some water for so you, oh, you got some water. Okay. So, um, yeah, well, maybe. So um, welcome everybody. Um, delighted that you could join us tonight and there's refreshments there, so feel free to, to grab them at your, you know, if, when you feel the need. Um, so I have a, I'm delighted tonight to be able to welcome you all uh, to this presentation and welcome our good friend Sabina Akiri, uh, and who is currently a, a Kellogg Fellow. Uh, for this evening's uh, event. And um, I think many of you may have met Sabine over um, in, in past visits of last year. But for the purposes of this evening, maybe I will give her a brief introduction and, um, and then she will uh, uh, present. So Sabina directs the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, a research center within the Department of International Development in, at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on multidimensional poverty and measurement and analysis, welfare economics, a March Ascends Capability Approach and the Measurement of Freedoms in Human Development. She's known for developing with James Foster, the widely used Alkiri Foster Method for measuring multidimensional poverty, which has been adopted by the United Nations Development Program. More recently, Professor Alkiri uh, and, and Ofi, um, together with the UNDP, undertook a joint revision of the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index to better align the index with the sustainable development goals. Launched in September of 2018, the index covers 100 countries and serves as a tool for policymakers to design efficient multi-sectoral policies. Among Sabina's publications is the uh, 2002 book, Valuing Freedom, Sense Capability Approach and Poverty Reduction, <coughs> in which he substantively engages Professor, Professor Finnis's work in considering basic goods and values at play in development. And tomorrow there's another event in which Professor Finnis and uh, Sabina will actually be in conversation, on, which is, I, I hope you all have an opportunity to attend that. Um, I think most importantly for me, actually, the work that Sabina does is really an effort to operationalize the work of Amartya to Sen, um, along with colleagues at Oxford and, and now a, a group of colleagues who are working all over the world with governments, actually trying to incorporate the work of Sen into national metrics, looking at sustainable development goals. So this is really exciting work, and I think we're really privileged to have her with us this evening to actually share um, the latest, if you will, um, work uh, at, at OFI and with the, the Multidimensional Poverty Index. So without further ado, Sabina, over to you. Delighted to have you. Well, first of all, thank you so much um, for the possibility to be here. I'm really happy to be here and I'm looking forward most to our interchange and uh, discussion afterwards. Um, I thought what I would do is first um, introduce a little bit about poverty measurement, uh, multidimensional poverty measurement for those of you who might not have done it for a couple weeks, um, and then um, go into a little bit about the findings that we had from the Global MPI this year. Um, and you know, if, if there are questions in the middle, feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go through some of the findings and then there should be ample time for discussion afterwards. Um, each year when we um, launch our work on the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, we try to ground it by talking with some people who are poor by this definition of poverty. But this year we did something different and we asked people, students from the Lady Dok College in Madurai, southern India, if they would do that with us. And so um, I think I will start by giving um, the case of Amuda. Um, and we did this because this year we found a very sad finding, which is that of the people who are multidimensionally poor, nearly half are children. And so we start with a case study of children by children. So this is Amuda. Um, her name has been changed, um, but uh, with her consent, her family's consent, they're very happy to be the subject of discussion. Um, and she's 14 years old, and she's a student at Lady Doak College, but also by the Global Multidimensional Poverty Measure, she and her family, she lives with her father, mother, um, sister, nephew, and niece, are multidimensionally poor. Um, both her father and mother work, but her father had an accident and cut his hand with a coconut. And so um, is a little bit uh, challenged in terms of agricultural and construction work, which was his profession. And, and her mother also works. 
So let me just get into multidimensional poverty through the lens, in a sense, of her life. Um, if you look across the health indicators of her household, um, and various members of her household face malnutrition. So they're malnourished in terms of body mass index for adults or stunting or weight for children. Um, the family are educated. The children are all attending school. Um, and so there's a good story there. Somebody has six years of schooling. But they cook with wood. Um, they can't afford the LPG, which would be the, a cleaner cooking fuel in that region. And cooking fuel in South Asia, indoor air pollution, um, is a leading cause of preventable death, particularly among women and children. They don't have clean sanitation. In fact, they use open defecation. They don't have any toilets at all. Um, they don't have clean drinking water. They take it from an unprotected well. Um, their housing, as, as you can see, is, is um, natural. So it's dirt floor, dirt wall, and, and a, a, a bamboo roof. And they don't own more than one of a small set of assets, radio, telephone, television, refrigerator, motorcycle, bicycle, computer, or animal cart. Um, and so those are the deprivations of her life that we are focusing on. There are many other things about her life that we are overlooking. She's a very gifted person. They're a very loving family. Um, she's a very joyful child with lots of aspirations about the future. She's doing well in school and the teachers appreciate both her personality and her, uh, ex how she excels in the classroom. But when we look from a poverty perspective, we get a part of the life, but not a whole of the life. And what we're trying to do is understand that a little bit more. So the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index um, that I'll be explaining was developed in 2010 um, with the United Nations Development Program and our group. Um, and its aim was to try to offer in the 20 year anniversary of the Human Development Reports, a tool that was more policy relevant than its predecessor, the Human Poverty Index, which was a general mean and a little bit too complicated to be understood. Um, and since 2010, we've updated it often twice a year and, and published the numbers. Um, in 2018, after the Sustainable Development Goals with UNDP, we revised five of the 10 indicators. Um, and we did this to better align the global multidimensional poverty with the index with the SDGs and also to basically take advantage of some improvements in the surveys that we had. And so this year we cover 105 countries. We disaggregate into 1,127 subnational groups plus 640 districts of India. Um, and we also disaggregate by rural urban areas and by age cohorts. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of data that are used in a harmonized way. So first of all, what is the structure? The MPI follows the human development index in terms of the dimensions, which are health, education, and nutrition. When we launched it in 2010 and when we revised it this year, we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to include work. We wanted to include violence, empowerment, um, shame, humiliation, and isolation. We wanted to look at many features of these, the quality of employment or the quality of health or education. But for an indicator that covers 105 countries and 5.7 billion people, you're very limited in terms of the data resources you can use. So these are the 10 indicators that mainly we can have for nearly every country. So the first is nutrition you are deprived if any member of your household for whom we have data are malnourished. We have child malnutrition data of children zero to five in every single country. Um, but we have women's malnutrition data in many countries, more than half, and men in some. But men are underrepresented. Sorry, guys. Um, in terms of child mortality, a household is deprived if any child has died in the last five years. In terms of years of schooling, they're deprived if nobody in the household has completed six years of schooling, nobody aged 10 and above. So it could be a child, it may not be an adult. In terms of school attendance, if any child is not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight, um, the cooking fuel is the same if they cook with 
uh, wood, charcoal, dung, a solid cooking fuel, then they are deprived if they don't have adequate sanitation by SDG definitions or clean drinking water by the same definitions, then they're deprived. If they don't have electricity, even if it be by solar uh, power, they're deprived. If their wall or roof are made of natural or primi primitive materials or their floor is just dirt, sand, or dung, um, then they're deprived. And if they own, don't own more than one of the same assets I mentioned earlier, then they're deprived. The three dimensions are weighted equally and each of the indicators is weighted equally within a dimension. So the health and education indicators are weighted one sixth each and the living standard one eighteenth. Um, and so first what we do is we obtain for each person, sorry, the profile of deprivations. So you can see that Amuda was deprived in, in these indicators. And if you add them up, it's 44% of indicators that she's deprived in, 44 out of 100, because she's not deprived in these three, which is 50%, and she's not deprived in electricity. Um, they don't have a legal connection to electricity. They borrow their neighbors, but we don't get into that. <laughs> um, so is Amuda poor? We have to ask, first of all, um, if she is deprived in more than one third of the indicators. So we set a poverty cutoff and we say that if a person is deprived in one third, then it's probably poverty. It's probably not a data error. It's probably not a voluntary choice. It's probably a condition of poverty that merits policy response. Um, we report cutoffs of 1%, 20%, 40%, 50%. 50 so there are many tests that I'll go into later. But that's the definition of who is poor. And then we report the percentage of people who are poor, which you'd be familiar with. It's like the incidence of monetary poverty. You know, 20% of people are monetary poor. And we report something new, which is intensity, which is the average deprivation score among the poor. Amuda was deprived in 44%, but on average, um, people in India are deprived in, in more, actually, at the moment. Um, in the deprivations. So um, moving to the content, um, we have data from demographic and health surveys for 51 countries, multiple indicator cluster surveys for 43, and combined ones for two surveys, and PAPTEM for three, and for six, we have used national data sets. So when you wonder what these surveys that are in the public domain that your students can use simply by sending a project description. Um, they get the password to download the data. This is, it's, it's, a, it's a huge benefit. So all of our data are in the public domain, um, except the PAPFAM and, the, and some of the national data sets. And so all of the disaggregations that we can do um, are available because of these data sets. And I think we're very, very grateful to the teams of NICS and DHS and the others for collecting these data and making them available for research. And, and analysis. The data that we have run from 2006 to 2016-17. It was going to be 2016, but then Nigeria and Burundi released 2016-17, and we couldn't resist, so we included them. <clears throat> so we cover 105 countries and 5.7 billion people. And the first observation is that 23% of them, 23.3%, nearly a quarter, are multidimensionally poor. And they're identified as poor again because they're deprived in one third or more of these waste indicators. And for countries that include upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries, and low income countries primarily, it's still a very large number. It's 1.3 billion people that we're talking about. Um, and so that's uh, sizable. And if you think of the number that the World Bank has for the $1.90 a day poor, um, it's, it's much, much higher, nearly double. So a couple observations about these people. Um, first of all, where do they wake up in the morning? Um, two thirds of them wake up in middle income countries, 889 million. Um, so it's, of the 1.3 billion, 889 wake up in a country that's not low income. So it's not the recipient of a lot of aid programs. Um, there's an argument that 
they should be able to deal with their poverty programs, but that's where most of the poor people live. On the other hand, um, on average across middle and income countries, 18% of people are poor, whereas in the low income countries, which are the darker, uh, sorry, the, the, this slice, oops, 65% um, of people in those countries are poor. So there's still a market difference in the incidence of poverty among low income countries. And that same difference occurs if you look at least developed countries, um, 43 least developed countries that we cover, their rates of poverty are much, much higher on average. But there's still a great um, divide um, in that there are some low income countries with very low rates of poverty and some high income countries with very high, sorry, upper middle income countries or middle income countries with higher rates of poverty. And so it's, it's a complex story. And the average income of the country is not a predictor of the average level of multidimensional poverty until you get to the upper middle income country bracket. So again, where do they wake up in the morning geographically? Um, very few in Europe or Central Asia. 0.3% wake, wake up there. 3% in Latin America, 5% in the Arab states, 9% in East Asia. So East Asia has China in it. It has, as you know, it's dominating the population along with South Asia. But this level of acute multidimensional poverty is relatively low in Asia. Um, but 83% are in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, it's a good slide on which to demonstrate or to, to remind you that the figures that we share in a simple presentation like this don't have their error margins. But were we to look at the error margins and the standard errors, we actually don't know if there are more poor people in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. Because when we, when we add in those errors, they overlap. And so we don't say that one has more poor people than the other, um, but it's probably about the same. And it's very high. Again, if you watched the launch of the $1.90 a day measures by the World Bank, you would have seen a very different profile with more poor people living in Nigeria than India, with poverty being dominated by Sub-Saharan Africa and not by South Asia. So they're really quite different stories um, when you look at this measure, which is a direct measure of multidimensional poverty versus when you look at an income-based measure. Um, the Population coverage, so I showed you and I, I stressed South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa also because we cover 99% of the people who live in Sub-Saharan Africa and 95% of the people who live in South Asia. Um, we don't cover that many in Eastern Europe or South Asia, only 43%. We cover 94% of South Asia and we're okay on the Arab states and Latin America. So just so that you can know, um, Eastern Europe, South Asia don't have these kind of data sets for most of their countries. And that's why I won't be stressing at all results from that region because they would really need to be done properly, but also because the MPI is perhaps not the best measure. And the other reason to show this slide is that although roughly the same number of people are poor in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, South Asia has many more people. And so on average, 31.3% of people in South Asia are poor and nearly 58% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. So again, the, the extent of poverty is much higher. Yes, sir? Question of clarification. Population coverage, does that mean actually these countries have gone and looked at these households or are they based on samples that claim to represent population. Right, so these are based on nationally representative samples, usually two-stage stratified samples um, that then can be disaggregated and we know and we have online, so I won't get into it today, the, non or the sampling measurement error and the standard errors analytically derived. So I've shown this for regions, low and middle income countries, and geographic regions, but the first step is to go down to the nation state and to look at, in a sense, where these poor people live by country. So I've just shown Africa, 
and clearly it has to do with population. So Nigeria has 97 million people, Ethiopia, 86 million. And after that, we have DRC and Tanzania, um, and then the other countries with, in a sense, the percentage of those 559 million poor people in Africa um, and where they live by country. It's important to look at the level, the percentage of people who are poor, but also the number of people who are poor. With population growth, we find, especially in changes over time, you can't just be happy because the percent went down. Often that's wiped out by population growth. Now, I mentioned that there are 10 indicators and that for each person we look and see which indicator they're deprived in. And if they are poor, then we look at their deprivations. If they are deprived in, a, in one indicator, but not in 33%, we censor it and we say they, they're deprived. We'll pick them up when we measure vulnerability or when we have a different measure with a cutoff of 1%, but they're not perhaps deprived to the extent to be in acute multidimensional poverty and thus to merit that kind of policy attention. So if we just focus on all of the people who are being left behind in several dimensions at the same time, then we see, um, the number of people who are deprived in each of these indicators. So for example, when it gets dark, 90% of the people who are poor, that 1.3 billion people, 90% can't turn on the light when it gets dark. Um, sorry, have to use cooking fuel. They can't turn on a cooking, um, a fire to cook their fuel, to, to cook their food. Um, they don't have LPG, they don't have even kerosene. Um, they, they must make a fire. Um, and so that's 1.2 billion people of the 1.3 are deprived in cooking fuel. And over 1 billion um, don't have adequate sanitation. Um, so it's either an unprotected pit latrine, for those of you who aren't au fait with these definitions, or you don't have anything at all. Um, uh, but something like a compost toilet or a protected pit latrine is considered adequate. Um, and it, electricity, which is what I started, is, is more than half. So more than half of these 1.3 billion people, when it gets dark, can't turn on a light. And 60% oh, of them have somebody in their household who's malnourished. It's not 60% of all of them who are malnourished, but you're living with one of your family members. And because you share, um, then this will probably influence many of them. Um, and again, over 1 billion people, 78%, um, have housing with quite serious structural vulnerabilities. If there's a solid, if there's a monsoon or rainstorm, you don't want to be in a house with a dirt floor. And so although these are numbers and statistics, and I'll be focusing on the numbers, for each of these, there are people and lived experiences behind them. Um, nearly half a billion people 30, over th one third of people live in a household where there's a child who should be going to school and who's not. And so we've made tremendous progress with the MDGs and then the SDGs, but still among the multidimensionally poor, there are high levels of deprivations in each of the 10 indicators. The lowest very happily is child mortality in the last five years. But of course, that's a very severe statistic. We wanted to add more health indicators um, but we cannot with the data sets that we use. So that's just to give an example, or an, an idea that across these 10 indicators and across the 1.3 billion people, we can not only look by countries and regions, but we can also look by indicators. And we'll be then combining the two to see how we start to move towards policy, looking at countries and their composition of poverty, and then subnational units within countries, and then the composition of poverty among those subnational units. So let me do that stepwise progression for a country, and maybe I should have chosen Kenya. Um, I chose Angola. Um, <clears throat> and Angola, we have relatively recent data from 2005, 6, 15, 16. And just over half of people in Angola are multidimensionally poor, uh, 51%. And um, each poor person is deprived in average on 55% of those indicators, so more than half. Amuda was 44%. And so their MPI is 0.283, which means that the people of Ang the population of Angola experienced 
of the deprivations that would be experienced if everybody in Angola was poor and deprived in all of these 10 indicators. So that's the intuition behind the, the 0.283. And what you can see very vividly is that rural poverty is much higher with 88% of people in rural areas being poor and 30% in urban areas. Um, and the intensity is also higher in rural than urban areas. That phenomenon is very common, as we'll see uh, across there. But the combination of a higher incidence and a higher intensity means that rural poverty is, is just far, far greater than urban when you measure it multidimensionally. Now, how are they poor? So that's the, the next question in MPI arrives. And I'd love your help on this because the MPI is one indicator in the SDGs, 1.2.2, but you can unpack it to look at indicators that relate to SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, and 11. And so it basically looks at people being left behind in several things at the same time. And so the biggest deprivations in Angola are electricity and housing, sanitation, and cooking fuel. Um, and it's, it's startling to some of us how high electricity deprivations are. Um, in, in a place that Angola is, is a wealthy country in, in, in some economic terms, um, but still quite deprived. And nearly 30% of people live with somebody who's malnourished and 31 have nobody in the household with, 30, with six years of schooling. So this is a little bit about the detail that you see when you pull it apart at the national level. And how is this used for policy? Because that's what we wanted to focus on. So, it's used at the national level to look at sectoral priorities. Um, I, for example, um, Nepal have used the global MPI as their national MPI, and they launched it in January of this year. And they looked at their allocation, but sectoral allocation of budget, and they found that it was not reflecting this at all, um, that they were uh, investing far too little in the health and education indicators in comparison with their contributions to poverty. <coughs> and so that led to a reallocation um, with this new level of government. Um, Costa Rica, using their own national MPI with slightly different standards, saw that the allocations were so far off that the president passed a presidential decree. And the decree stated that from now on, the budget has to reflect the composition of poverty. That was in 2015. Um, 2016, they reallocated the budget, and there has been, been in the years since then a very strong acceleration in the reduction of poverty. And the minister who made those changes is now president of Costa Rica. So it's interesting um, the different dynamics that that has. What I showed you then was just the percentage of people who are poor and deprived in each indicator. But remember that the health and education indicators are weighted a little bit more. So if we look actually, and the MPI, one of the reasons that it's popular in the policy world is that it is simply made up of the sum of the weighted contributions of each indicator. So the height of these bars is the national MPI, the urban and the rural. And the stripes is the, how much each indicator contributes. And so this is actually the, the numbers that are used for budget allocation. And years of schooling, nutrition uh, contribute more when you add the weights than do things like cooking fuel or sanitation deprivations. And they do that because of the normative importance of the health and the education indicators being <coughs> somewhat higher uh, relative to the others. But then the next step is to look within a country. And uh, my co-author on the methodology, James Foster, has worked his whole career on finding measures that can be sub that are subtly consistent so it can be decomposed by population subgroups. And the MPI reflects those properties as does incidence and intensity. And so this is a map of Angola and the slightly lighter pink, the colors aren't quite right, are the, are the poorer regions. And the slightly darker red are the slightly less poor regions. And of course, Luanda, the capital is the least poor. Um, and uh, these are in the middle. So that's just, um, something about the level. Now, how is the level of MPI used in policy? It's actually used a lot, and this is something we have to be aware of because 
it becomes politically sensitive, it's used often for <coughs> allocation of federal resources to state go provincial governments. And so there's a need to really look at those, um, the budget allocation formula to make sure that they give incentives for reducing poverty. And so you don't want to be the poorest region, you want to be the region that reduced poverty the most and you get more recognition that way. At the same time, you do want to drive resources to the poorest um, venues. And so different places have different ways of doing that. But very clearly, it helps to map subnational. Another reason that this is useful for policy beyond the nation state is that the dollar 90 a day measure of the World Bank, which is indicator 1.1.1 of the Sustainable Development Goals, if you think about it, you've only ever seen it at the country level. And that's because it's very hard to disaggregate it subnationally. And the reason it's hard is that it relies on the international price comparisons, the PPP, purchasing power parity dollars, which are only available at a national level. And to do the subnational, you need rural and urban prices, you need inflation adjustments in the rural and urban areas, you need uh, the consumer price index um, and, and its variation across the country. And it's not possible at this time to do it at a large scale. And so if you're an international agency, if you're Caritas, um, you might want to look using the same definition across different countries and think of where to focus. And um, some of the aid agencies, World Vision, they've been quite interested in looking, um, using the same di 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 definition of poverty across different regions. And the reason that we can do it so easily is, is a little bit sad, but we're measuring deprivations directly. And a malnourished child in Angola is a malnourished child in Mozambique or in Cuba. And so, in a sense, you are comparing like with like, which you can't do with a monetary metric. So I just showed you a little bit of what we see for Angola. For each of the regions of Angola, we also have the composition of poverty by each of the indicators. And I'll be showing that later on for India. Um, but I just wanted to show you first the countries in Africa. Um, so just some of the poorest ones. Niger is the poorest, according to the global MPI, followed by South Sudan, um, Chad, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Central African Republic, Mali, uh, Madagascar, and so on. And so in this diagram, the height of the bar is the value of the MPI and the color stripes are its composition. So we can see at a glance, both of them. But of course, journalists wants to know what percentage of people who are poor. And we can say, um, say, say the percentage as well. So another step of informing policy, just to give you an example, is that you can have the same level of poverty. If you just look at a map, you can have exactly the same MPI value but have that poverty constructed in very different ways. And I could do this for two regions of a country, and I'll later show you Chhattisgarh and Bihar in India. Here, we'll do it for two countries, Tajikistan and Peru. Both of them have nearly the same MPI, nearly the same headcount ratio, about 12% by the global MPI, but the poverty is very, very different. And so what you can see from here is that in Tajikistan, uh, malnutrition is really dominating um, and also it has much higher levels of child mortality and much more of children out of school. But nearly every household has somebody who's six years of school, has somebody with six years of schooling. Um, and the deprivations in assets or in electricity or in um, sanitation are minimal. And if you look at Peru, you see quite a different pattern. And so it's this difference in compos composition of poverty that then leads across subnational regions also when provinces or states get their level of poverty, they look at the composition and then they need to do that. So going back to the example of Nepal, um, they're now doing training at the provincial level to the new governments on how to use the MPI for provincial level budgeting, which they're doing for the very first time ever um, this year. So that's a little bit of an intro to what the data are covered and all of these data are online in data tables, um, as well as in um, briefings and reports. Every country has its own briefing um, that has a lot more detail than I shared. 
But a natural question is how does multidimensional poverty relate to dollar 90 a day poverty? And we released this on September 20th. I think it was September 19th, the World Bank released their new dollar 90 a day measures. And they're pictured here. So the bar, the height of the bar is the percentage of people who are MPI poor. The height of the red bar is the percentage of people who are deprived in 50% or more. This is 33%. The black dot is the percentage of people who are poor by the dollar 90 a day measure. And we're trying to get this more visible, but there are a lot of countries where the black dot is actually in the dark red space. It's much lower. And so you have multidimensional poverty rates that are more than double the dollar 90 a day rates. And then there are a few where it is significantly higher or a couple where it's the same. <laughs> and so our feeling is that it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but they're measuring different things and there's no sense that they coincide. And so in that nice metaphor could be that you have two eyes and with the two eyes, because they're slightly apart, you can see the same phenomenon from different angles and you have a more accurate understanding of it. And so similarly, we, try to use both measures together in understanding people's experiences of poverty because neither one alone tells the full story. Um, and that's similarly the case when national governments adopt MPIs, they usually continue to use their monetary poverty measure and then develop a separate MPI measure to stand alongside it. Now, how does this happen subnationally? I mentioned that the global dollar 90 a day cannot be disaggregated, but we do have national monetary measures for many countries which are disaggregated because they're constructed by the national governments precisely for that purpose. And so it's quite interesting to compare. And we were recently in Bangladesh and they were fascinated because Silhet has the lowest level of monetary poverty, which is green, I wonder why, and the highest level of multidimensional poverty. So it's a huge mismatch and they liked it because it made sense. Everybody knew that Silhet mining district had high levels of poverty because they didn't have services infrastructure, but monetarily they were not poor. They had a conditional, or, sorry, simply a cash transfer program um, and also high employment rates. This recurs, whether it's um, Papua in Indonesia, whether it's Gaza in Bhutan, you find subnational regions that are not poor in monetary terms because there's some industry um, that gives them these benefits. But because of their remoteness um, often or a lack of integration between the industry and the communities, they're very high in MPI terms. And in, in a sense, this is again what drives home to policymakers the value added of having both measures together when it comes to policies, because otherwise they would have been allocating the least to Silhet, or in Bhutan, the least to Gaza, where it's 11 days walk to the Nana. So that's a snapshot of one period of time for 105 countries and 5 billion people. Um, two slides on the Uigui details, and then we'll go look at some changes over time. So um, a question is, these data are 2006 to 2016, 17. You know, how bad is it? Well, the good news is that uh, about 800 million of the 1.3 billion people, their data came from data that was collected, fielded 2015 to 2016 17. So many more than half have data simply from 2015 or later. And then an additional uh, 390 million uh, have data that was fielded from 2013 or 2014. Um, so the countries that have older data sets are not home to a large number of, of poor people, about 1.19, nearly 1.2 of the 1.3 billion people um, have data since 2013. Um, but we wanted to include Somalia. Uh, we wanted to include Maldives or Bhutan, and these have earlier data. Our oldest data is Somalia, it's 2006. I don't really want new data. Um, and also a question is, um, about the indicators. So 87 of the countries have all 10 indicators, but seven countries each lack child mortality and um, nutrition data. And Philippines lacks two indicators. 
um, it's the only one. Um, the others are just black and white indicator. Um, and then another question is, so we changed our results, just so that, you know, had we had the old results, there would have been 1.39 billion people poor. So in gross numbers, it didn't make much difference. Um, but a question is, to what extent do you have to agree with these weights? Or do you have to agree with the cutoff of 33%? How different would our results be if we took a different decision? And so remember, we have standard errors for everything. So this is one, my one moment to bore you to tears. But um, we look at the standard error of each country and, we can, and then the country next to it, and we see if they overlap or if they're the same. And considering that, we compare every pair of countries across the distribution and we say, okay, let's say you value a cutoff of 20% and you value 40%. How many of these pairwise comparisons would be different? And we find it's 5%, 5.1. So 94.9% .9 of the comparisons are exactly the same if the poverty cutoff is 20% or 40%. So it's relatively robust. And then what if you don't agree with one third of a weight on education, you're the health, you're the education minister. So you want half. You're the health minister, you want half on health. Infrastructure wants half. So we rotate. And so each dimension in turn gets one half of the weight instead of one third. And the other two get one quarter of the weight. And then we do the same thing with the countries and the standard errors and we say, what difference does it make? And 89 or 87? 87% of the comparisons are the same. So these are the kind of tests that we do. And there's academic stuff that goes into this in gory details if you're interested. Um, oh, so I have a question about that. So if you did it just for, um, for health, because as you mentioned, mortality is low, is high that you know and but you're still giving them the same weight Does that matter at all if we swap the weight between nutrition and mortality or, or you know just the fact that the instance of one is so much higher than the instance of the other but they're getting the same weight Does that matter somehow so we preserve the equal weighting within dimensions but it would be I mean technically it's very easy to change the weight across I think the reason that we didn't is we got pushback. So some people would say nutrition is very important because it's affecting future life chances. And somebody would say that child mortality is more important because it's such a, an irreplaceable tragedy. And so the, you know, we go obviously and, and try to talk about the weights, but it's, it's not possible to have a, a ranking necessarily of one over the other. And so that's why we've gone for the equal weights. Um, and finally, I just wanted to draw your attention. Um, we've had some students do theses on the border of Punjab, India, and Punjab, Pakistan, or Bangladesh and West Bengal. And some of these border areas are quite interesting. So there are two surveys, one in Bangladesh, which was collected um, six months before the one in India in two adjacent regions, Rangpur in Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. And um, What's interesting is that the MPIs of Bangladesh is much poorer than the MPI of India. Um, and also that's the same for these regions. So Rangpur is much poorer than West Bengal. Um, but you see that the compositions of the poverty are very different. And so it's quite interesting across national boundaries again to do the in-depth work. But what I'd like to do now is just turn to, um, in the last part, to India. India was our lead story. And even the 29th of October, the story popped up. Every two or three days, there's still stories popping up in the India press and in the South Asia press about um, the, the findings that we had in India. So I wanted to share them with you. And it's an example, again, of how when you have data over time, the MPI can be used to evaluate policies um, as well as to give incentives for change. So if we use this measure, um, in 2005-06, which was the NFHS2 survey, 55% of the Indian population were multidimensionally poor. And moving ahead, it's 27.5%, 28% in 2015-16. So it's a decade apart. Um, and so the number is that poverty went down from 635 million to, to 364 million. So effectively, given population growth during that period from 1.16 to 1.32 billion people, 
271 million came out of poverty. Now, if you look at China between 1990 and 2000, by government of China standards or 1995 to 2005, World Bank, or sorry, vice versa, um, about the same number of people came out of income poverty in China, 268 million by one, <coughs> 270 by the other. And so multinational poverty is not monetary poverty, but what we're seeing in India is a change of global proportions. Um, it's a very, very large shift and a shift that really merits notice. At the same time, India still has 364 million people living in poverty. And so this change would need to be sustained um, for more than a decade to come. So how did this change happen? One happy story is that every single indicator of the 10 indicators de declined statistically significantly, and most of them were cut by half. I should have said that the headcount ratio was not cut by half, but MPI was, and I'll, I'll tell you why, I'll show you why later, um, but that's one of the fascinating things. MPI is a better statistic politically because it, it can be cut by half. The same happened in Nepal. They cut MPI by half, but not headcount ratio. Um, but the interesting thing, and I'll just spend a moment explaining these axes, is if you think subnationally across the states of India, so this graphic has the states of India, um, and this is their MPI in the original period. So Bihar, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Meghalaya, Rajasthan, those are the poorest states, right? The size of the bubble is the uh, number of poor people who live in them. And on this axis is the speed of their reduction. So it's a race to the bottom, it's a race to zero poverty. And so who is making the fastest progress? Well, it's these states, it's Jharkhand, it's Bihar, it's the poorest states. And that's a very happy graph. If you think of leaving no one behind, you want a graph where there's a slope of this kind, where the poorest are making the fastest progress. You don't want a slope like this where the poorest are being left behind. And so it's, it's an interesting finding. And how did they make change? Um, as I said, you can break down each of the states, each of the subgroups, whatever you cut it by, by uh, indicator and see how change happened. And simply at a glance, without looking into the details, you can see that the patterns are not the same in each state and they do vary quite a bit. Um, I also wanted to sh give a shout out for some of the less poor states. For example, um, these are the, Jharkhand was the fastest progress, Chhattisgarh, Bihar, West, uh, Meghalaya, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh. These were among the poorest 10 and they reduced pro poverty the fastest. But also you have to remember that this is in absolute terms. And so a state like Kerala had very low levels of poverty of about 12%. Well, it got it down by 92%. So the relative change in Kerala was the highest of all the states of India. And um, so it's interesting uh, to, to look at both relative and absolute change, which of course we do in academic work. And the other interesting thing, as I said, is you can see that states are different, um, but the red and purple are Bihar and the two greens are Chhattisgarh, um, uh, states that are um, Chhattisgarh is primarily a tribal state. Um, Bihar is the bit of the non-tribal bit of, of the previous Bihar. Um, and you see that their patterns are really quite difficult, different, where school attendance really came down and it was a much bigger problem in Bihar originally. And um, cooking fuel reduction was higher in Chhattisgarh as was reduction in sanitation. Um, electricity patterns are very different. They both had strong drops, but in Bihar it had been a much bigger problem whereas water was a much bigger problem in Chhattisgarh. So this is again to say, in terms of using the MPI for policy, you're looking at the original deprivations and the magnitude of drop. And it may not matter much to you sitting here in Notre Dame, but if you were the Minister of Education at the state level in Chhattisgarh, this would be interesting. Um, if you were facing election as a, a governor and you had run on a platform that was about sanitation, um, this would be interesting. And so measures have different dynamics when the people responsible are being assessed very publicly, very transparently against them. 
And for example, in, in, in Mexico, state governors now cannot win elections unless they make progress on MPI. And so they're running to the statistics office to say, what do I have to do? Um, and they're using the metrics now for management. And so it might be interesting in a university to think of how the business community you know, could interface with metrics and say, well, how to improve governance can we use McKinsey, uh, use and McKinsey worked in with President Santos in Colombia to develop a management structure that used the metrics um, to develop uh, a system of, of delivering the, the target in a timely way. So I spoke about the pro-poor trend by states, but we also, of course, look at children and children reduced MPI poor poverty the fastest. We, we look at castes and the scheduled tribes are, of course, caste group followed by the scheduled caste and they reduced MPI the fastest. And then we look across religious groups and Muslims are the poorest and they reduce poverty the fastest. And so um, as you're, I, I said that I would unpack this mystery of why the headcount was cut by half and was not cut by half, but MPI was. And it's because among these poor groups, MPI goes down because a person is deprived in 80% of the deprivations, and then they move and they're only deprived in 60, but they're still poor. Or they're only deprived in 44, like a muda, but they're still poor. And the MPI is covering this reduction in intensity that is not visible in the change in headcount ratio. And so again, it's giving added incentives to leave no one behind. If you only look at the headcount ratio, and one person is deprived in 80% and one person is deprived in 44%, you're going to put your money here because it's cheaper to get them out of poverty. And so in terms of policy, you want to give policymakers an incentive also to look after the people who are deprived in a, a higher percentage of deprivations. Now, why were these findings of great interest in India? One is that, as I said, 271 million people coming out of poverty is tremendous. And, and that was of great interest. But another is that this pro-poor story is a happy one. And when I ran this story using data 1999 to 2006, our story was that the poorest groups are making the slowest progress. So in a paper with Shimon Shet, we had this, which was the reduction of monetary poverty. So again, you saw Bihar was the poorest in 1999. It had made the fastest reduction in monetary poverty. But this, was multidimensional poverty from 1999 to 2005, six. The poorest groups had made the slowest poverty. So they were being left behind. And so it was a very disturbing finding and it was the same for the Muslims and the same for the caste and it was the same for the children. Our finding was taken up by the World Bank. So in their global monitoring report of 2015, 16 at the end of the MDGs transition to the SDGs, um, they profiled our result um, to say why you need to go within countries and look at patterns within countries. And it was also the first um, policy document of the bank to use the multidimensional poverty index. So that's um, a little bit about the MPI and what it has done in India. At the same time, India still has 364 million people who are poor, 27.5% more than one quarter of the 1.324 billion people who live there are in poverty, wake up with this acute condition of being deprived in one third or more. And for $1.90 a day, it's 13%. So it's less than half, it's 170 million. Um, Bihar was the poorest state in 1999. It was the poorest state in 2006, separated from Jharkhand, and it's still the poorest state. Muslims were the poorest in 1999, 2006. Muslims are still the poorest group. Again, scheduled tribes remain the poorest caste group and half of them are multidimensionally poor. Um, and children aged zero to nine are the poorest age group. Um, so the polarization has gone down. It's gone down very visibly. And our hope is that this pro-poor trend would continue. Um, but uh, we are, uh, putting this out because there are con concerns that without a positive reflection on change and providing incentives um, that are very visible 
where people can celebrate pro poor change, it could be reversed quite easily. Um, and so that's a little bit at the national level. We also, for India, and this is the last slide, um, have data down to the district level. Um, we have data for 640 districts. It's the first time, and it means in terms of sample representativeness, we have 2.8 million people were asked questions in India in order to obtain um, data of this high resolution. But the hope is that this will also enable communities at a lower level of aggregation to take responsibility for um, reducing their poverty. And so as decentralization goes um, uh, and, and lower levels of government are empowered both fiscally and in terms of, of the powers of decentralization, that this kind of information would be, enable them to take constructive and evidence-based actions. Um, and recognizing it's not the full view of poverty, um, hoping that it still would be part of, of, part of the, the objectives that they would want to go for. So that's the global MPI in one period, the global MPI over time. And um, the only thing I wanted to say at the close is that there is an interface with policy, not only in terms of measurement, but also in terms of trying to look in an integrated way at the re policy responses. So the MPI looks in an integrated way at people's lives. When you get to know Amuda and tell her story, part of her story would be her, her charm <laughs> and, and her intelligence, but part of her story would not just be the income poverty of her family, and they are income poor, but it would also be these interconnected deprivations that strike her at the same time. As Amartya said, said, said they batter a person at, at, together. But the interesting thing is that the policy responses often also have to take an integrated view. And in the 1970s, integrated development was thought to then fail because it became too bureaucratic. Um, institutional failures uh, meant that it was not as cost effective as individual sectoral policies. But now the, a lot of the empirical studies of the MDGs had showed that um, it is more cost effective to take a synergistic view to look at poor people's realities and have multi topic, multi sectoral integrated policies to address them. And so, for uh, a center in a school that works on integrated human development um, and uh, looks at human development in all its dimensions, um, I wanted to say that the policies to address human development will then also have to be integrated at some level. And so, tools like this. Um, whether it's for poverty or whether it's for well-being might be interesting because you can then also take an integrated view um, at, at, at a policy level. And I could give lots of examples from different countries of how they're trying to combine it um, and, and so address jointly the, the deprivations that are experienced jointly. But I will stop there. Thank you. So we'll invite some questions. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have uh, questions. One is, you said that you know you're looking at two different things when you look at poverty and you're looking at powerful implications. You know, all you should talk about the bottom billion and just focus on effort. Poverty and this this probably affected aid. We know also from Sam's work and other people things like you know electricity. So uh, I think this seems to me at least to be better than income. But can you say why you think that this may not be as good as income in some ways since he works for this? Have the floor. I just asked the other one too. Um, you know, um, poverty is also poor, relatively speaking. Of course, it doesn't matter if you if you have three years of schooling and everybody else has twenty, uh, then it's going to make a big difference. So, uh, also in terms of assets, difference. So, while I you know, certainly looking at who's deprived in an absolute way is, is but what about the inequalities? Is there 
some some work to look at, for example, different parts of Union where politics are rising, you're focusing only on the bottom. And so when people get out of absolute poverty, they will say, wow, yes, we've done it. Yeah. So uh, just your thoughts about these two issues. Okay, very good. Um, yes, on what income, I wouldn't say better or worse, I would say they're focused on different phenomenon. I think it's easier to measure multidimensional poverty, it's cheaper. Um, most poverty measures, the global MPI uses 39 questions from a questionnaire. Most income poverty measures use 450. Um, and so the, the, the economic cost of gathering the data is, is lower and perhaps the questions are sometimes easier to answer. Um, so maybe the non-sampling measurement error could be a little bit more contained. But um, a person could be multidimensionally non-poor and in prison or multidimensionally non-poor and not able to buy lipstick or something that they deeply value. Um, maybe not lipstick, but you know, <laughs> uh, not, not able to buy incidentals um, that are not food related or not. Uh, and so uh, a general purpose means in, in sense term is part of, you know, capability expansion. And yes, wealth is only a useful for the sake of something else, as Aristotle said, but um, having wealth means that you can have the freedom of how to spend it in a way that if you simply have a discrete amount of services, you don't have that same freedom. And so that's why I would say that it adds a flexibility that these lack. Um, in terms of, I should say that the bottom billion, just, he counted the billionaires because he counted everybody who lived in the countries in Collier's book, Paul Collier's book, The Bottom Billion. He didn't count poor people. So I'm afraid I, I object to that way of counting people. <laughs> okay. um, and then in terms of the, the second issue um, and relative poverty, two different responses. First, then in talks, of course, about um, the fact that in the space of commodities, something could be relative, like a linen shirt or leather shoes, but in the space of capabilities, it could be absolute. And if I switch over to a bit more of a theoretical hat, in the multidimensional poverty measure reflects an axiom of focusing only on the poor. So any changes among non-poor people don't affect it. And in order to get that property, you have to have a fixed and given poverty line or deprivation cutoff, because otherwise you lose that property. And if something happens up among the billionaires or among the people with PhDs, your educational deprivations could change. And so I want to construct a measure that was absolute in the space of capabilities or functions. Um, but what is actually happening is that countries are defining different deprivation cutoffs. So here it's six years of schooling, in Mexico it's 12, in Japan it's 10. Um, or here it's just having a, not having a dirt floor, other places you need much better housing conditions or you need a flush toilet or you need, and so the state of Maharashtra in India, we're working with them because they're a, an up and coming state and they don't want to look at acute poverty, they want to look at the next step of poverty. So in terms of how do you look across society, there are two ways, maybe three, but one is you can either, I mentioned different poverty cutoffs, and so we can look at anybody who's deprived in anything, and then we have an entire distribution, and then we can make any inequality measure from that distribution, Kyle, Atkinson, Gini, whatever. Um, however, I don't like to do that because a lot of the data above the poverty cutoff are spurious, you know, fashion models with a low body mass index, or, um, you know, just they're, they're not real deprivations, they're, they're data errors. The other way to do it is to have these other deprivation cutoffs. And so you do a measure of moderate poverty, like the League of, um, the League of Arab States and UNESCO together have done a regional <coughs> Arab poverty report where they use the global MPI, then they use moderate poverty levels. Or you could go up above that and use, as Bhutan does, a gross national happiness index. And so segment the society in different ways and see where people belong. And that might be a better map and then you can do heat graphs of how that map changes over time. I'll stop there. Right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Valenstein. I'm at the Kroc Institute. I'd like to congratulate you. I, I mean, I have been working on 
collecting data very soon. So really doing very well. Uh, and in fact, you mentioned at the beginning about violence. We actually do have some violence that might be, might be of use to you. And that's down at a very detailed level on the exact location where things are taking place. So I think cooperation. Uh, my, my real question is, uh, when you look at these 10 uh, indicators that you have, um, I'm sort of thinking how independent are they from each other? It seems to me that some of them might go together, but uh, housing, sanitation, that could very well be the same kind of a program in, in some sense. So have you been thinking about that? I mean, do you really need all the 10 or could you I'm satisfied with a few? I noticed, for instance, on China, you had no data on housing, which surprised me very much. Saying why China have fewer people than are poor. But it also leads me to think, uh, could it be that these things are relate to each other? So say that you have a big housing program, that could actually be the key to each other, so that it would spur lead to effect, so to say, in the local that would actually solve some of the other problems. Now think about it. You think there is sort of a theoretical connection and something which could be almost a development strategy, but what would be most important to do. Mm. The connections between these terms is basically what I'm asking. Yeah. So on the first, um, in terms of violence data, is it the ACLA data set? No. No. This is, oh. this is where Ah, good. So we have, there's an ACLA data set, which basically has subnational violence of different kinds. It has riots and manifestations. It has um, homicide um, and it has blasts of uh, different kinds. And they're co collated from reports and it's a World Bank data set. And so we have done a paper, um, 34 of 40 African countries we cover, we have the GIS location. It's fuzzed out for anonymity reasons, but we've use the best we can, and we've matched it with the actual data with different definitions of uh, the distance from the violence and the severity of the violence and whether or not we include, um, which categories we include. And we've added it into the MPI as a fourth dimension, and then we just crossed it with the MPI. And um, so that's work in progress, and now we'll extend it to India um, uh, with the actual data, but we're worried by the quality of data. So we don't know if that's better. So if you have better data, yeah. we are your... We are in a bit of a rivalry. So. Fantastic. <laughs> I don't know, I would love because I'm not happy with yeah, it. We, could, yeah, so we are not either. So, <laughs> so look at the USDB because it's global. US... On a conflict data. Okay, okay. okay. So look at that and you will see it covers much more. I view and how it has a higher... Oh, very good. And then in terms of the... All of them, I mean, Yeah. Absolutely. And then in terms of the association, so we do, obviously, we look at that. If you look at correlation, it's very, very low, but correlation is the wrong statistic. So we look at, if you think, like in India, 18% 18 18 of people were deprived because a child was not attending school, and 22% of people were deprived because nobody in the household had 16 years of education. Now you think an educated parent sends their kid to school um, and you think that an educated parent lives in a place where there are schools so the children are more likely to go to schools. And so you think basically, probably they're the same. The overlap is about 18%. Almost all of the children not going to school live in households where there's not an educated parent. And that's what theory would tell you. Empirically, you look at it, it's 7%. And so we do this across every country, across every pair. We look at the mismatch and the match. And the shock has been that it's very, very low. There's one indicator pair which are redundant um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, which are electricity and cooking fuel. Not surprised. But we kept it in because when we looked across time, people get electricity, but they continue to cook with cooking fuel. And this indoor air pollution is such a big health problem. Um, that the sequence is that you don't get rid of both deprivations at the same time. 
Um, so we kept it in, although there is technically redundancy. But we published that, and I didn't put it in here, but we have that for, for every country, and we have that for all of the countries put together. Um, and it's, it's not what theory would tell you, and that's the fascination of all of this is that it's, it's not predictable. And what that calls for is you know, cluster analysis and people really looking at that. It's better when they're panel data. And then basically you can see, okay, they were deprived in, these, in this period and then next period they are, or they're always deprived and what's the caustic combination that characterizes chronic poverty. So we're trying to do um, studies with panel data because you can get more detail of that kind. Yes. So, so along the way, when you were talking about the weighting of the different elements in the index, you just said in passing something to the effect of the greater weighting of health and education reflects the relative normative importance of these things. But I'm interested in what's behind that statement. In other words, how, how, do, you, how do you arrive at the relative normative importance of those? Is it just through sort of listening to what the people want who use it? You know, you, at one point, a different point, you talked about pushback and in potentially weighting them differently? Or, or is it because of sort of what you've seen as their instrumental value to other forms of well-being, or a, a, a more speculative reflection on how they fit into human flourishing, or maybe all of these things together? What, what's behind it? So I think um, we settled with this, and I was just talking to Gary, with these three conceptual dimensions. Dimensions don't enter the data sets. They're just in our minds. What enters the data sets are the 10 indicators. But we settled with them instead of equal weighting, um, partly because if you think of nutrition versus access to a sanitation, many people would say, well, you know, nutrition is more important. It's more important because it has long-term impacts on children's ability to learn, on people's ability to work, on health, on survival. Um, and so equal weighting didn't seem adequate. Um, we then went to the HDI dimensions, partly because the weights had been so bitterly contested. So I don't know if you know, but in 1991, like Mark McGillivray um, wrote a bitter article, there, were, there was a huge flurry of articles on the equal weighting between health education and living standards. And as a result, a number of studies were done. One was desk studies to experts, where they would send to each of you a survey of how important you think they are. And, and they came back as being roughly equal um, from the experts. And then there were econometric you know, tests. Um, Schumann Schett, Mark McGillivray, and James Foster looked at the robustness of the HDI to changes in weights to see how sensitive it was using the same thing that I did, shifting to 50% weight on each indicator in turn, on each dimension in turn. And those sort of validated the equal weights across those dimensions. And then from our survey data, we couldn't get more health or education indicators. We could get more or less living standard indicators. There's a statistical advisory committee, so they wanted them to match the MDGs, so they wanted that basket. And so we equally weighted them within. And so because of the number of indicators, living standard indicators are weighted less. Um, but like there's a paper that'll be going up soon by Gisela Robles Aguilar, who led MPI with me for two years, um, where she compared the MPI with our weights to the MPI with equal weights. It actually isn't very different. It'll be an interesting paper for you, but it's not that different. So, um, hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's something that the, our late and beloved Sir Tony Atkinson, he said we needed to look into more because clearly if if it's very robust to weights, then any one indicator should be say, the, same, the same as the other. So we should have these high associations and we should have, you know, that you could use a proxy for the MPI. But clearly that's not the case. But clearly within a range, there's quite a bit of robustness. And so we need somehow in our, in our theory projects, we need to map um, the, the succession of weights and, and numbers of indicators and how they why, at what point it becomes robust enough to actually stand, up, stand on its own. Um, Questions on sort of the world of data collection and how your work is affecting that whole universe. Because you've got people out introducing MPI to um, different governmental data collection agencies. 
what do you see happening in that world um, in terms of adjustment or um, competition or you know, the, the existence of the World Nutrition or World Bank um, data collection? And the variance is obviously up here when you look at these two together. What, what's, how are people perceiving that? And, and maybe sort of along, along those same lines, <clears throat> this now integration with the SDGs, is that, you know, is that proving to be a driving change as well. So what's happening in that larger space? So in terms of um, the data, the first thing to say, I think, is that I don't know how much of you followed the data revolution vocabulary. There was an idea that the sustainable development goals required a data revolution, and there was a commission set up to look into this data revolution, which came out of the open working group um, and we've just had a World Data Forum in, in Dubai uh, following up on the World Data Forum in Cape Town. So there's lots of these going ahead and they are intrigued by big data and they're neglecting household surveys, seeing them as out of date. And for a person who works on poverty, that's quite sad because if you have global data, satellite data, administrative data, you usually don't know who are the family members. You usually don't know you may know how much they pay to charge their cell phone, but you don't know their education level, you don't know their health, you don't know their housing conditions. So it's actually impossible from the big data sources to compile data on poverty uh, of this kind. And also, in a sense, the monetary poverty is easier to predict um, in the flow term, but maybe not in the, in the absolute term. And so I think that's the, the lack of attention is the biggest concern. What is happening is, first of all, um, there is obviously a call for better data on quality of health, quality of work, quality of education. And so the first set of national MPIs came out in um, 2009 in Mexico, 2010 in Bhutan, 2011 in Colombia, Chile was 2012-13. All of them now are revising their MPIs and revising their surveys and trying to improve the data, particularly on health and work where they feel that the usual questions are not adequate. And so we're thinking of setting up actually working groups on different indicator areas, because although every country is different, um, you can have some standardization, I think, still of what, what would be useful. Um, I think the other issue is disaggregation and periodicity. You know, if you're using the MPI to manage, like Colombia, Colombia updates its MPI every year, and it puts it in its census. So every 10 years, it has it down to the local level. Mexico, every five years, has it down to the municipal level. Um, and, but many places have that demand to go subnational, um, and they don't have the data. And so there's a need to, it, there's such a tax on statistical offices, they're overburdened. And so a need to figure out easier ways of collecting data frequently and then processing it quickly. So Afghanistan released its 2016-17 ALCS survey you know, late in 2018. And by then, your numbers are already out of date when you release them. And so uh, the shortening the data processing is another area. And the final is that the criticism of the global MPI for what it excludes are fair, um, but that requires going back to the data providers. For example, every DHS in the mix, so we have data on employment for 4.4 billion people, and we can't use it because of how they ask the question. It's so frustrating. Um, so it's, if the powers that be that are all the international agencies that oversee the surveys might be able to come to the view that it would be useful to change those questions, we could add employment. And so there, there's some things like that that for me are low hanging fruit, but it requires, it's a collective action problem. <laughs> so it's politics, not. Yeah, but did the SDG process where they actually try to come to some agreement about sort of universal metrics for the SDGs, did that help you or did that, did that lose it? Both. I think what helped was focus on integration, the recognition that's all the way through the SDGs that poverty is multidimensional. Um, and in target 1.2 out of the 100, there are 17 goals. The first one's poverty, there are 169 targets. The second one is multidimensional poverty. The first one is monetary. And there are 232 indicators. One is 1.1.1 1 .1 is $1.90 a day. The next one is national monetary. And the third is multidimensional poverty. So it's prominent in the SDGs. Um, but the problem is that there are 232 indicators. So I, have a, I wanted to attend the seminar at the same time about the tyranny of metrics, because that's happening. 
yeah. governments are just exhausted by producing all these indicators. And I think what they like about the MPI is it's simple. It collects not 232, but 15 <laughs> indicators and, and enables them to prioritize. So I think in that sense, where it's going now in the SDG com conversation is really focused on what national governments want to focus on and prioritize. And the MPI is then a tool because you put your priority indicators in it. And then like a bowling alley, you try to hit 10 pins with one or two strikes. Yeah. Uh, one or two hits, you try to figure out the interconnections and the most efficient attacks. So I think you all, do you want to ask a question? Yes, just about data. Uh, I'm curious about the nutritional data, mm -hmm. because maybe, you know, might be the most difficult to collect because you need to measure the yeah. people, or I don't know how you do this. And also, if you receive this data, um, like the, the raw weight and height, or if you, from the, because you receive the data from the countries, right? From the countries, correctly. Mm -hmm like uh, weight and height, or if you receive already evaluated, like it's saying this child is malnourished or is obese, or how, how does it work uh, on the nutritional aspect? So it's anthropometric, except for China. Um, in, uh, so it's measured height and weight. Um, and uh, we use the iGROP ADU file of using the WHO reference group to compute um, the <clears throat> median of the reference population, and if they're two standard deviations away, then we report the child to be underweight or something. For adults, we use 18.5 if you're 20 or above, and for people who are less than 20, we use the age and gender-specific BMI cutoffs that are uh, by the w WHO, mm -hmm. so those standards. We don't assess malnutrition for people age 70 or above, because there are no agreed standards, but bone density goes down, and so the proportion of them who look malnourished is very high, but it's not clear if that's because of bone density um, or if that's because of malnutrition. Great, um, Sabina, thank you so much. I mean, this is, uh, it's extraordinary to see this, um, the volume of work you might have been able to sort of uh, embrace with this multi-dimensional poverty index and, uh, and enable us all to sort of see it so clearly. Very much. I hope everyone will join me in thanking you. We have a special table, table um, five or something for the Indian districts because there were too many of them. I got complaints and so I took out the districts. So we just have the states and the subnational. But table five has all 1,127 de decompositions for every country. But for India, we have a separate table for the districts. And it has their level, which is what we picture, but also the composition. <laughs> but they are not in 2014 DHS. We had in the previous okay. mix, we had a hundred. Yes. Okay, so I was trying to do an do opportunity kind of analysis on whether or not I should write the list. How much is it worth to you? So that's reported. I have a number of numbers, but in terms of based on the score, the score of this one with respect to whether. So, I know I remember in my head last year's numbers. I don't remember. Last year's numbers 75 percent. I'm a very fast grader, so I can. I would probably. Like my fast grade is like 95 percent. Any of them? Like 94 bad. I would need for an hour or two, and then right in. And one billion people were only. The last one I got was 90. 
we just said oh, for purposes yeah. if I can say that. I'm just told yeah. yeah. to yeah. 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 very nice to meet you as a character like we'll be yeah, I saw you last time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's not far where we're going to have right Thank you. 
Assim, eu só usei o site da Because there was one person in that whole building that knew where you guys went. <laughs> uh oh. I, I found you. I didn't miss a shot. You should have called. Well, that would be the next step. Actually, I sent the text. But uh, I, I, I got you. 